Today's guest is just one of the coolest humans that I've met in my journey. His name is Prince Daniels Jr. Um, he has an incredible story, incredible story of perseverance, honoring himself, um, seeing what's possible, work ethic, taking him on his journey to play for the Baltimore Ravens. And he, then he talks about the ultimate low that he hit after that whole dream ended or abruptly and early due to injury. I, I feel like I'm going to spo spoil it. I don't want to tell you the rest. The story, it, Prince is just awesome. He has such an impactful message. Um, please, I know it's a little longer episode than normal, but please listen to the end. You will be rewarded. <laughs> it is really, really amazing. And there's just so many nuggets of wisdom or thought provoking moments that will get you thinking about how you're seeing things in your own life. So I'm just really grateful to Prince for taking the time to come on and share with us. Um, we do talk about his book. Um, and so I'll link that up in the show, no show notes. It is, uh, he actually has an audible audio book. Cool. I haven't listened to his book yet. I'm definitely gonna, definitely gonna listen to it. Um, I've got it here on Amazon. It's mindfulness for the ultimate athlete, mastering the balance between power and peace. I can't wait to hear what he has to say about that. Very, very cool. Um, yeah. And then we'll link up his you know, social media and things like that, but I'll go ahead and let us dive in. I really hope that you guys listen all the way to the end for this one really great messages. Um, we'll go ahead and get started. Here is Prince Daniels Jr. All right, Prince, we've been, I've been waiting like a long time for this interview. We're finally here. I have been so excited. This has been one of those things on my calendar that I'm like, yes. <laughs> Sometimes I'm like, see stuff on the calendar and I'm like, no, nah, it's not like that. But this one, you guys are in for a treat. Thank you so much for taking the time out time from your beautiful daughters, time from all your other things you got going on to come share your story yeah. with my people, because it is, I told you before we started, it's like it, one of the most impacting stories I've ever heard. So thank you for taking the time yes. and welcome. Uh, thank you. Thank you for having me. You're so welcome. I'll, I would drop, I wouldn't drop a lot of things for a lot of people, but for you, I definitely, you know, drop my kids off in front of the, the TV <laughs> Just for a little bit, just for a little bit. Thank uh, you. Uh, interview in because um, I, I appreciate you. Uh, uh, I, I, I cherish you. I admire you. And I think that you Thanks, are friends. incredible and great person. So, uh, yes, it's absolutely a must to uh, be here and, and speak with you. Mm, thank you. Thank you. And we had a little connection. We'll give a little shout out to Haloti Nata because that's who we connected to. I was like, oh, hi, we met at a business mastermind. I'm like, you know, what's your name? What do you do? And I'm like, oh, the Ravens. I'm like, do you know Haloti Nata? And you looked at me, Prince. I don't know if I ever told you, but you looked at me like you, it was like, you like looked me up and down. Like, who are you? You were like, Haloti is my brother, brother. Who are you? <laughs> I was like, oh God. I was like, I was, I helped him lose some weight when he retired. You were like, then I was in. You were like, oh, okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> so hello, hello to you if you're listening. Much love. <laughs> All right. Um, so let's start. If you don't mind, um, sharing your journey into the NFL, um, what that was like for you. And I, you just talk as long as you want because I know it's a little bit of a journey. So I'll let you take it from here. <laughs> All right. Um, so I guess I'll start um, just quickly, you know, and I'll zoom through that. But growing up as a kid, uh, I grew up, uh, um, I was born in Houston, Texas. Then I grew up in Mississippi. We moved to Mississippi when I was about two years old. My parents got a divorce. Um, from, from there, I, I lived in Mississippi and um, passed my, um, my formative years. Then we moved back to Houston around 11 years 11 year old, and when I was 11 years old, and uh, <clears throat> I grew up there, had brothers and sister, and from there, uh, um, I went to go and live with my father when I was around the age 13 years old. And it was perfect timing because I was a young male, and my mother, she was a single mother, but she had, she had mates. Uh, and she she remarried several times, um, but everybody was like a stand up individual. And uh, I remember at that time I was I was getting into a little bit of more of the uh, how do I say it, the mischief with with my friends and my cousins. And 
my mom said, I think it's time for you to go stay with your dad. And I just did not think that that was a great idea. My father, he's from another country. My father's from Ghana, Africa. Okay. And so his lifestyle and his culture and his mindset was completely different than mm. the way um, I was raised or brought up um, just in America. And uh, um, my very first time, my dad picked me up uh, to um, <laughs> to take me to his house because I think we lived like 45 minutes away in, in Houston. He lived on the southwest side and I lived on the uh, on the southeast side. And and so he picked me up, put my bags in the car. And so we drove, drove on the highway. <laughs> and then when we got on the highway, he said to me, you will eat, you will wake up, you will do your work, you will <laughs> go to school, <laughs> come home, eat, clean yourself, go back to sleep, and do it all over again. <laughs> wow. I remember looking out of the window, <laughs> and, and tears just started. Start oh. <laughs> oh, man, I'm in prison, <laughs> right? And so uh, he looked at me, he said, are you crying? Are you crying? And uh, he said, do you want to go back home? I said, yes. And so he drove me back home, uh, opened his trunk, threw my bags on the ground, <laughs> and drove off. <laughs> Whoa. And my mom came back home, and she was, she said, from, from work, and she said, like, well, why are you here? And I said, because my dad dropped me off. I was like, we're good. I'm back. <laughs> and so my mom said, no, I, I have to let you go and stay with your father. Uh, you need mm -hmm. to grow up. You, know, you need to be a young man. And so that was one of the best things that my mother could have ever done. I know it was difficult for her to let her her first uh, uh, born child, a uh, born male child, you know, go. But I need to go live with my father. My father made me into a male, into a man, understanding what a man is. In order for anyone to understand or a young boy to understand what a male or a man is, they have to see one. And so my father was really a, a really good man. And that's what helped, uh, helped me with my discipline and helped mm. me um, um, navigate myself through this world. And so my mom, she gave me the love and the nurturing that I needed, uh, that every individual needs in this world. But my father, he, he gave me that discipline, that accountability. Mm. And from that point on, uh, um, I lived with my father until uh, I finished high school, and then it was time for me to go to college. Now, uh, getting a scholarship, I wasn't your typical, should I say, uh, scholastic um, athlete. I, I, I struggled with the standardized tests, the ACT, SAT. Uh, I know I used to have a lot of friends that would get other, other people to take their tests for them had a lot of pride. Plus my dad was just like, "You are you studying? Are you studying your books? Education, education. So that was his biggest thing. And, um, you know, so I, I took my test. I didn't do, I didn't, I didn't get the passing score that I needed uh, to, to get a scholarship. But I was, I was like talk of Houston, Texas, you know, mm -hmm. and, and in all of Texas, I was ranked like number, um, the top 50 running backs in, in, in Houston, Texas. And so uh, um, I got offers from Tulane, Purdue, Michigan, Michigan State. Uh, uh, any, uh, I was hoping to get something from Texas, but I never got anything from Texas. And North Texas uh, and, and a couple other schools as well. And so uh, when it came time to go to sign with a school, since I didn't do well on the standardized test or since I didn't pass the standardized test, but I had like 3.6 GPA. Uh, um, all the scholarships that were offered to me took them away. And wow. so I was left with no scholarship, a little embarrassment, a little shame. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, but I knew that uh, um, something had to happen. I was a very, I was in tune at a young age. Just, I knew I had a lot of luck. I was very spiritual, just... I was just always in the right place at the right time. Mm. And, and since I didn't get, get a scholarship, time passed and was trying to figure out what was, what was going to happen. I was at track practice one day and one of the coaches from Georgia Tech, out of the blue, he, he was coming to recruit someone else. 
And my head coach told him about me, said, I got a diamond in the rough, man. Said, top running back in Texas, fell, in the, fell under the radar, didn't sign with anybody. Um, but he just passed his, his standardized test and he's good to go. Uh, and so the coach said, well, let me just see some film on him. He saw the first play. I had ran somebody over. I had jumped over somebody, jumped over my fullback. And then I, I ran the guy over. Then I ran the eight yard touchdown. He was like, "Stop the tape!" <laughs> and then he just scared, right? And so, um, when is when, that enough for you guys? Is that enough? Are you not entertained? <laughs> yeah. And so he comes outside, and I'm outside doing some handstands from like the crow position. You know? <laughs> Uh, and everyone's, you know, and so I had like a circle around me. So he comes and breaks up the circle and he, he introduced himself, Lance Thompson. I'll never forget his name. And he asked me if I knew what Georgia Tech was. And I said, in the state of Atlanta, <laughs> <laughs> I was a really sheltered child. I didn't know much. <laughs> so he said, no, in the state of Georgia, but yes, in Atlanta. <laughs> so, uh, he told me, he said, I saw a tape on you, man. You ran an 80-yard touchdown. It's like, that you can do that again in college? I said, I know I can. Uh, so uh, one thing led to another. Fast forward, I took an uh, a unofficial visit to Georgia Tech. I fell in love with Atlanta. I fell in love with Georgia Tech. Uh, I was excited about the academic challenge that they had, and it was an engineering school. So, uh, you know, my, my father ingrained it, ingrained it into me about education, education, and I took pride in, in, in being uh, uh, smart or just being able to, to do your work in the classroom. And so mm -hmm. uh, uh, since I took pride in, in that, you know, I, I, I had made a, a promise to myself that I was going to get good grades and be you know, the top running back uh, at, at Georgia Tech and the starting running back at Georgia Tech. And so um, I took that promise with me. And. Um, as I, so as I, I met with the coaches, they told me if I do good my first year or second year, I can earn a scholarship and uh, be at Georgia Tech. And so um, that story did not flow as fluid as you would imagine. All right. Um, <laughs> it's, it all started with uh, it all started with it was this, a, a, a number of changes that happened. I get to Georgia Tech. Uh, man, I, I realized at Georgia Tech that I that my 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 studying skills was very subpar because <laughs> every single class was very difficult, and um, I had to learn how to uh, adapt very quickly. So uh, I had to figure something out, and I just knew if, if I work hard, the work ethic that I had was. Don't no matter what you do not stop. No matter what you keep going, mm -hmm. and um, so my first year, I you know scoped out everything, see where, where I uh, measured amongst you know my peers, and 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 from there, uh, um, the second year, I think my my head coach at the time, he he ended up leaving, and he ended up taking a job. At Notre Dame, his name was uh, George O'Leary. He took a job at Notre Dame, and the, the coaching staff there was a transition. So we had new coaches come in. At the time, we had Chan Gailey come in, and Chan Gailey was a, a, a NFL coach that came down to college level, and it was his first year at Georgia Tech. So as a new coach, he's trying to figure out everything and and figure out where he can insert his players that he likes, and and so um, when I first, when I made my initial visit to Georgia Tech, my unofficial visit, I met with George O'Leary and another coach who was the offensive coordinator at the time. And his name was Bill O'Brien. He's still coaching, I think. Uh, he, he's somewhere in, a, in, a, in the NFL. And we were all in the room, myself, my mother, George O'Leary, O'Brien, and we we had we, we did a handshake on if I do good on and off the field, then uh, I can earn a scholarship. And so I felt that I did good on and off the field my first year, but I didn't get a scholarship. And uh, so now I'm fast forwarding to 
after my first year is over and we're going into my second year. And it's spring 2000 and ooh, 2002, spring 2002. And the coaches, they had this, this transition. They brought in some new coaches. We have the new head coach, Chan Gailey. He's trying to figure out who, what players are who. We had players moving from one position to another position. We had a DB, a uh, defensive back that moved from the de- defensive back. He was like number three in the depth chart at defensive back, and he moved to running back, and he became the, the starting running back. I was like, what? Like, he didn't even get any reps. How, how is he getting, getting uh, all these reps? He just took everyone's reps, but <laughs> he was incredible. I uh, like when, when I saw when I saw him play, it made me realize that I had a lot of work to do because uh, the things that he was doing was astronomical. And I'll never forget when we uh, I got to stay on track, but I'll never forget when we, we, we I saw him play in a game. He jumped from the five yard line and still had room before he almost uh, jumped out of the end zone. I was like, wow, I can do everything he does. Except that, <laughs> you know, and his name is Tony wow. Hollins, and I'll never forget it. And from that moment on, after seeing him play at that high level, I mm-hmm. knew that uh, I had a lot of work to do. Mm. So uh, that's what I did. I started working. I started working on myself. I started working on my skills and my ability. And spring ball, 2022, I mean, 2002, uh, we have to – play the spring game, and then we have a a player exit. We meet with the coaches. We sit down and talk with them about what you can work on and and, uh, how you can improve yourself and get better. So we had Chan Gailey and O'Brien, who we had to meet with. Now, I have a history with with O'Brien, but not much of a history with Chan Gailey. So I, I go to my exit meeting. And as I go to my exit meeting, I'm sitting down with uh, Bill O'Brien. And as I'm in the, in uh, waiting, uh, one of my teammates comes out. Bill O'Brien opens his, his uh, office door, uh, ushers, I mean, just lets my teammate go come out, and it's time for me to come in. When I come in, he doesn't close the door. So now <laughs> he leaves the door wide open and just, you know, it's the walk-on kid, right? And, and so I, I remember sitting down, and it was a uh, it was an interesting meeting. So we sit down, and he's talking to me. He's telling me that I'm too mechanical, and and uh, I don't know I don't know many of the plays. And I had a rebuttal, and I was just like, "Well, I don't know many of the plays because you never gave me a playbook. I got to borrow other my, my teammates' playbook." So. He said, well, okay, well, all right. So, all right, I'll give that to you. You don't have a playbook. All right, so, but (laughs) that doesn't give you an excuse not to know the plays. Uh, He said, you can learn from other players in front of you. So he puts on film, shows me uh, film of other players that have made it uh, to the NFL under his his coaching. And and he asked me, he's like, you think you're better than them? And I said, yes. (laughs) <laughs> he said, you think you're better than this person? I said, yes. You think you're better than that player? Yes. No, I am. So after a while, well, no, nah, not after like five minutes, he put down the remote and he just turned and looked at me. And he said, let me ask you a question. You think you're going to play at Georgia Tech? I said, yeah. He said, let me be completely honest with you. You're not going to play here at Georgia Tech. I can call some of my buddies from Brown and, and see if they can get you in the school. You can play there. He said, because I know that you're pretty smart. Everybody knows that you're pretty smart in the classroom. Uh, he said, but let me just put it to you. You're not going to play at Georgia Tech. Your chances of playing at Georgia Tech are one in a million. And if you think you can make it to the NFL, your chances of making it to the NFL are one in a billion. And he said, with those odds, you're not going to play here, man. So uh, what I want you to understand is, uh, maybe if you get on special teams, maybe you can play then and see the field, but that's it. And I remember I was in the room and my, my knee was bouncing. You know, I'm one of those guys when my knee bounces. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it, my knee bounces because it was, it was keeping me calm. 
because I was mm-hmm. I was getting a little flustered. I was mm-hmm. wondering why was his individual speaking to me at this time. I'm seven. Uh, I'm 18 years old. And I'm trying to figure out why is this individual speaking to me like this? Like I, I, I've never done anything to you. Why are you treating mm-hmm. me like this? Mm-hmm. Uh, and and so he goes on to say that. Uh, well, I interjected him and I asked him a question and I said, "You don't think I would make it to the NFL or play at Georgia Tech?" And he said, "What? Say so you fucking suck." You fucking suck. That's what he told me. And he said, you know, just get out of my office. I'm just wasting my time with you. Wow. And I remember my knee was bouncing and my eyes watered up. And I told myself, don't you cry in front of this man. Don't you cry in front of this man. You better, I don't care what you do, you hold back those tears. And at that time, in my head, I was saying to myself, get up and choke him. <laughs> get, up, get up and just choke him and just look into his eyes and... <laughs> but I had to have a guardian angel that day because I moved. I could not move and the only thing I was able to do was scoot up in my chair and my knee kept bouncing and my eyes watered up and I remember saying to him like don't think I'll, I'll play at Georgia Tech and make 10 NFL and he said Get the fuck out of my office. You fucking suck. Like that. Mm-hmm. And it remind you, his office door was wide open. So mm-hmm. everybody heard it. Wow. So the humiliation was at an all-time high. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The the debasing was at an all-time high. Totally. Uh just 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 Completely demoralized. Yeah, yeah, it just took my confidence to completely demoralize me. Right. And but I had I had some dignity about myself, right? Mm-hmm. And so mm-hmm. um so as I'm leaving, I, I I stopped to go speak to Coach Gailey, and he I'm pretty sure he heard the whole conversation. I mean, who could who could not hear the whole conversation? Because even the the uh the, the secretary at the time, um her eyes had watered up for me. Because Aww. everyone just, just saw me as a really good person. Mm-hmm. I'm a genuine, authentic, kind person. Mm-hmm. And, but I didn't understand what was going on. Uh, and, and so I went to go meet, meet with Coach Gailey, and we had a, a quick talk. And he said, well, right now, you're just not what we're looking for. And for whatever reason, I was like, well, what are you looking for? <laughs> and he said, wow, that's a good question. You know? I don't know. And at that moment, the one in a million and one in a billion, and I don't know what we're looking for, was a, a sign for me to say, there's a chance. Right? And so I'm wow. that chance happened. Wow. And I remember walking out of his office, and there were some teammates that were lined up there waiting to, you know, uh, do their exit meeting. And I didn't want no one to touch me. Just, just, I, it's like, don't, 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 don't touch me. I'm, I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. Right. And, but in the inside, I was ready. If somebody would, if somebody would have said, give me a hug. <laughs> right. <laughs> You're like, I'm not ready to release like that in front of everybody. So please give me some space. <laughs> give me some space. Don't touch me. And so this is, this is springtime. Uh, students are out of school, so the bus runs instead of every 15 minutes, it runs every 30 minutes. I felt that I, as soon as I came outside, I felt that the bus had already passed and I had to wait another 30 minutes. So I'm sitting at the bus stop. Bus did not come. It's desolate on campus. And I'm just sitting there. I'm just like, what's going on? What's going on? And I'm frazzled. You know, my knee is bouncing. Uh, one of the coaches passes by and oh, he, he told me, he said to me, he said, P, he said, I heard everything. I just want to tell you, I'm sorry. He said, but I want you to keep your head up. He said, because you got something that all these other players don't have. Wait, can you repeat that, Prince? My computer did something where, what did he say to you? My coach said to me, he said, P, I heard everything. 
He said, and I'm sorry. He said, but I want you to, he said, I want you to keep your head up because you have something that all the other players do not have. And I remember my head was down and I had tears coming down my face. And I looked up and I said, what's that coach? He said, you got this, you got heart. Mm -hmm. And he kept beating on his chest. You got heart. And that something happened to me at that moment in time. Because, uh, you know, after he passed, I looked up at the sky. I was like, why, God, what did I do wrong? I didn't do anything wrong. I'm always doing the right thing. What did I do wrong? And I just remember I just stood up and I pulled down my backpack. I said, fuck waiting for this bus. And I just took off running to the other side of campus and tears were just streaming down my face. And it was about a, a like a mile plus to go from one side of campus to the other side of campus. And um, I get to the other side of campus and I'm bawling. I, I did not slow down. I kept running. I felt myself, you know, being tired. I, and I, I did not stop. I run to the other side of campus. I go upstairs. I take off my backpack. I change my clothes uh, to workout clothes. And uh, um, the, the 1996 Olympics were at Georgia Tech. And so they, you know, they, they built the dorms and they had like uh, um, volleyball sand pits around. And so um, that was where my first workout was, where I passed out. And so basically I went to the volleyball sand pit and I worked out for the next three hours and I worked out until I passed out. And I just remember waking up and uh, I was weary. I was, I was, I was out of it. <laughs> and so I, I made my, my way back upstairs to, uh, to the dorm room and my, my teammate, he had just ordered some pizza and I remember it was super greasy. <laughs> And I just, you know, he said, you can have some pizza, man. And I ate some pizza and I uh, ate that pizza, went into my, my room and I just closed the door. And I, I just sat there and I said to myself, I am never, ever let anybody take my dream away from me. Ever let nobody take my dream away from me. So for the next three months, uh, I would wake up every morning. I would run to the other side of campus. And we had weights. I would lift weights. After that was over, I'd run back to the other side of campus. And I did this for the next three months. T, I I did not stop. I, I, it was this burning sensation inside of me that said, you ain't going to never, ever talk to me like that again. Ever. I'll never let anybody disrespect me like that, make me feel like that ever again. And I just mm -hmm. said, made it up in my mind and my heart that this is what I'm going to do. And so I started pursuing that dream and that goal and, 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 and I started studying more. I started becoming a student of not just the game of football, but a student of the classroom, sitting in the front of the classroom, doing everything, doing the extra work. Uh, uh, you know, I, I would also uh, let my teammates copy off my paper because they knew that I, you know, I studied, I did the work because I, I would not accept no or answer. And I didn't want anybody to tell me what I wasn't good at and I'm, that I'm not great. My father told me that I was always great and he instilled that discipline in me and he showed me um, how the world would be. And so I, that was my first taste of it. So when when uh, I was sitting in the room with O'Brien, if it wasn't for my father, I'm pretty sure I would have got up and choked him. But I had, it was like I had discipline. It was like I had the guardian right. angels with the, right there with me, just, just saying, just Take it all in. Take it all in. Mm. And we're going to transfer and channel that energy into something that's productive and constructive and not destructive. So um, I always had an opportunity. And, and so my teammates would see me when I would run to the gym. And it would be like somewhere between like six to ten people either in the car or in the truck. And they're all going to the gym. And they would stop. And... Say, P, oh, let's get in. I was like, no, I'm good, man. I'll see y'all at the gym. And, you know, they, they tell me later now in this present day that uh, when they saw me running back and forth, you know, from workouts and working out in the sand pit on the weekends, they said right away they knew 
that he, he focus. He, yeah. he focus. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Mm-hmm. And, and, and one, one of my teammates, I uh, recently met with him and he said, in my 20 years, I've never seen nobody work as hard as you, man. He said, you, you got that Kobe Bryant Michael, <laughs> type of work ethic, man. He said, it was a Saturday night. I'll never forget. And he said, you were outside in the sand pit working out while everybody else went out. He said, I sat outside for 45 minutes. He said, and I watched you. He said, you didn't look up at me one time. And he said, man, we play the same position. And he said, do I want it that bad? He said, should I go upstairs and put my clothes on? He said, he didn't. He said, because he realized that he didn't want it as bad as I wanted. Mm-hmm. And he said, from that point on, he knew that he had competition. <laughs> I was like, wow. I said, I didn't even think about it like that. I was just... I was just doing what I what I, <laughs> what I was set to do, you know. He said, "I know." He said, mm-hmm. "And that's why." He said, "And that, that's why I love you, Pete." He said, mm-hmm. "Because you were just being you, and mm-hmm. that's you, and and you put in the work ethic when everybody else was out there playing, like mm-hmm. you did it." Like he said, and so it doesn't surprise me that you are where you are and you did what you did. You meant mm-hmm. to be. Mm-hmm. Um, so, um, so so coming back, so now, uh. Um, I the, the the season begins, so we have about five, six running backs in front of me. So I moved. I, I ended up going down to the seventh running back on the depth chart because we recruited more more running backs, and they still we still had our seniors as well that were looking to to transition, and I didn't know where I was going to be, but I knew that I had outworked everybody. Uh, and I was still going to continue to outwork everyone. It was just, it was just in me, just to keep working because I knew, I always knew this one thing when I was growing up was if I do my part, the God or the universe will do do their part. Mm-hmm. And it was always like a serendipitous situation mm-hmm. for me because uh, I would always continue to do my part, and then when that opportunity came, I ran with it. And so um, the season begins. The senior goes down, tore his knee. Uh, another senior fell out of school. Another senior tore his knee. And the, the younger guys, had just wasn't fully developed yet. And so they had to call on his walk-on. <laughs> and one game we were playing. So we played BYU. I'll never forget it. And I remember just, I mean, at this time, I think I'm like 19. Uh, no, I'm still 18. Uh, and... We played BYU, and everybody at BYU had already went to mission <laughs> and then came back. So they're like 23, 24 years old. <laughs> like some big men, right? <laughs> I'm like, geez, these guys are big. <laughs> like, what, what year was this? What year was this, by the way? Because I was at BYU around this time. <laughs> <laughs> so this had to be 2002, 2003. Okay. Uh, yeah. I was there 2001, 2002. So, yeah, so okay. Uh, like Reno Mahe days. And yeah. All. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yes. So uh, they come and we're playing at Georgia tech and uh, one of the running backs, he gets injured. The, the one that I was just telling you about that, that I sat down and, and had dinner with and told me how hard I worked. Um, his name was Gordon Clinksdale and uh, he had a concussion. One of the guys from BYU just knocked him out, you know, had a concussion. And so my coach, the, the special team coach, said to me, you know, uh, Daniels, you know, it, it's time for you to go. It's time. It's, your, your number's being called. You know, so I'm like, <laughs> oh, this is a surreal moment. I get on the field. I'm like, I'm on the field. Oh, shit, I'm on the field. Like, I'm about to knock somebody out. <laughs> you know, and so – that's what I was telling one of my teammates because I had told him uh, uh, the night before we were playing video games. I told him, I said, hey, man, I'm, I'm going to knock somebody out tonight. I, said, I, I mean, tomorrow, I said, I'm going to knock somebody out tomorrow if I get in the game. Man. I'm going to knock somebody out. And so I get in the game, and as, I, as I'm as i in the game, I told I was screaming to my team, man, I'm about to knock him out. <laughs> I'm about to knock him out, you know. <laughs> you know I got coaches screaming at me like, but Daniel, be quiet, you know. And, <laughs> And so my teammate is screaming. He's like, he said he's going to knock somebody out. So that same guy that knocked out my, my, my running back, I took a personal. 
<laughs> and so <laughs> I was like, you ain't gonna knock on my brother like that and get away with yeah. it. And so, oh uh, so <laughs> kickoff happens. He's streaming down. He's running downfield, hauling ass. And I never forget, we, we were supposed to create a wall and run back and create a wall. And he was running. I just took off running in his direction too. We just running, 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 running. I said, whatever. And I said, here it is. I closed my eyes and I gave it all. My head started ringing and everything. And, and when I opened my eyes up, I'm on top of him. And he was just like, uh. And I just remember just screaming like, Look! <laughs> <laughs> And so they had to get the, um, the, uh, the they had to cart him off the field. And, oh my God. and man, from that point on, I was just so amped. So amped just to be there. And and from that moment on, you know, I was thinking about what, what Bill O'Brien said, and just like, you're not, you're not gonna play at Georgia Tech. The only way you get on the field is through special teams. So I just checked off that box. I'm on, I'm on the field, special teams, right? And then uh we fast forward, we, we we ended up playing another game against Wake Forest. Our kick returner, he got injured, so I had to go in and be the backup kick wow. returner. And so my coach told me, he's like, hey, hey, right before the play, <laughs> right before kickoff, uh, kickoff return, he said, they're going to kick you the ball. When you get the ball, reach the block, and run that tutor to test that. <laughs> <laughs> and so, man, I mean, as the ball was in the air, I could see it was in slow motion. It was flipping. And I just did like this. <laughs> no. <laughs> you know, I did a little cross, cross symbol across my head and my chest, and I caught the ball. And when I caught the ball, I started running. And it seemed like everything was in slow motion. And, I, and as I'm running, I see somebody in front of me. And then somebody, one of my teammates came and blocked him. I was like, oh, shoot. Whoa, I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. So I, I ended up getting horse collared after about 51 yards, but I almost scored a touchdown. And from that point on, like, the whole stadium erupted. My team, my team wow. erupted. And everybody was just slapping at me on the helmet. I was like, I need to take this helmet off. <laughs> you know, and... From that point on, um, we ended up losing that game. But that was the highlight of the game. I almost scored a touchdown. And so we went to meetings the next day, and Chan Gailey, uh, he was leading the meeting. And in the middle of the meeting, special teams meeting, he just stopped the camera. And he said, uh, turn the lights on. He said, I, you know, I, 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 want to, um, I want to say, you know, he, he, he said, a man, a, a man. If a man is wrong, it's a, if he admits to his wrongs, um, and, and I forgot exactly how he said it, but he said if, if a man is wrong and he admits to his wrongs, then um, he can redeem himself. And he said, "I'm that man that I want to say that I'm wrong, and I want to let everybody know that we got we have somebody in here that's special." He said, "I told him no." And he never accepted that as the answer. And I remember I had my head down. I was just like, mm, what is he talking about? And he <laughs> called my name. <laughs> and he called my name. He said, PJ, PJ Daniels. And I'm just looking down. And he said, this right here is what Georgia Tech is, is the definition of a Georgia Tech player. And my eyes start watering up. I'm like, hey, what's going on? He said, for that, you deserve um, more playing time. And so from there, I started getting more playing time. And then um, I had the journalists. They started vouching for me. They started asking, like, who is this P.J. Daniels kid? You know, like, why does he have a scholarship? Like, why is he still a walk-on? And so everything just started going in my favor. And I ended up getting a scholarship. I ended up playing at Georgia Tech and started breaking um, um, NCAA records, most rushing yards in the bowl game, um, all, all conference, all academic. Uh, I was just winning awards left and right and, wow. and getting a lot of recognition. And then from that point on, um, I ended up getting drafted to the Baltimore Ravens shortly after that. So um, it, it was an incredible beginning. It was definitely humble beginnings. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I had to fight through a lot, you know, fight through a lot of adversity, but also learn how to grow up uh, and, 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 and grow thick skin. You know, when somebody tells you that you are not enough, that you suck, and that you will never be able to play 
here or do this when that was a childhood dream. And so um, for everybody that's listening, if you have a dream and somebody tells you that you cannot accomplish it, you never listen to it. You never, you know, uh, uh, accept that 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 dream or or that that reality that they just crushed. Uh, you 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 create your reality. You manifest mm-hmm. your reality, and you can do that through your heart and your mind. Uh, mm-hmm. And that is that is those are the two things that help navigate you to get to uh, what you want to manifest. And so. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, you know, I, I I'm I'm a bit advocate for that, and and when I see that somebody has that, and someone else tries to uh, 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 debilitate them from from actually accomplishing their their dream or their goals, I'm always that person that's like, oh, I see it, he has it, oh, or, or she has mm-hmm. it. Let me go and say something to them. And I always feel that whenever I speak from the heart, they listen. Mm-hmm. regardless if they are distracted by their emotions I because i i'm speaking to their heart you know mm-hmm. and and i know some of the times whenever i do speak to people the things that i'm saying are going over their head but it's not intended for their mind it's intended for their heart mm-hmm. so uh, uh i just remind everyone like your heart your heart is the most important thing on your body because your brain can go your brain can 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 be a vegetable can go dead and you can still live. But if your heart goes, then everything else goes. And so um, just believe in your heart. Your heart is the one thing that will allow for you to, to, to accomplish the things that you've always desired, you know, aspired towards and, and um, that you feel is a part of your, your, your whole being and makeup. So just want to share that with mm. your audience. Yeah. Thank you for there's so many like little details in there that I'm sure people picked up on. But like, for me, like when, when that guy, I mean, you were 18 years old, first of all. So it's not like you were real mature and had a lot of wisdom under your belt of like, Oh, this guy's like insecure or whatever his problem is that he's treating, you know, you're, you're not going to be there. You're 18. And he's telling you one in a million, one in a million. And the, even the guy, and you see the secretary crying for you. Like it's kind of this like victim, super victim moment of like, and the fact, and the other guy's like, yeah, we don't even know what we want. We just don't want you like that to be an 18 year old and just take that. And instead of being like, I suck, it's over. Just, you know, head hang low, kicking the dirt on the way home. You went with, oh, so there's a chance. He said one in a billion. So there's, there's a chance. Okay. And that is, I mean, that is, to me, that is the ultimate definition of humility. Because your ego didn't block you of like, well, that was embarrassing. I don't even want to see any of those people again. Like F that guy. I hate him. But, you know, all of these ego protective things that we tend to do as humans when we're embarrassed or ashamed or to feeling defeated, you didn't do that. And I do think like I, another thing I noticed is like, you don't accept defeat like that. You, you, (laughs) you don't defeat yourself. That's how I would put it. Because we can only really choose to be defeated within ourselves. And that's, I mean, so much of what your message saying there is like, mm, no, <laughs> if I want it, then I'm going to do everything I can. It's just freaking incredible. And I know we don't have like a ton of time left. What um, we do, what we do, what we do. Keep going. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, so like, you know, so you, it's like, okay. And then you played for the Ravens. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, um, I did, I was wondering if you could speak on what it was like for you. Like you worked so hard to get there. How long, how long did you play in the NFL? Uh, three years, three years. Okay. So you're playing in the NFL for three years, your dream, you did it. You achieved the impossible, you know, you weren't even going to be able to play at Georgia tech. You, right. and then now you're like, ha ha ha, here I am. I did it. And then after what was that like for you oh man see when when you have um when when you have the work ethic that i have right hunger the insatiable hunger that i had um when when i when i saw my progression when Haloti saw my progression when Ray Lewis saw my progression when all the whole defense saw my progression and the offense and and the the, the coaches upstairs when they when they, when 
you can see your own progression and you realize that you are like men amongst men. You buy into it. Mm-hmm. You buy into it so much that you, you, you know, you become that character. Mm-hmm. And I ended up getting hurt. Uh, my third, going into my third year, which is my contract year. And mm-hmm. it was a, it was, a, it was a lot going on in my head. Um, we started to have talks with the Ravens. Uh, I haven't had a chance to play uh, a down in the NFL except during preseason because I would always injure myself because I was going so hard and I never right. really dial back. It was always go hard, go hard, go hard. And so I never right. had a trainer. I just I, I had a work ethic. And so I just felt that I didn't need a trainer or anyone to tell me <laughs> to gear it down. So um, and then when I saw what I was capable of doing from my coach is challenging me to me challenging myself. Then that's when the mind, the body, and the spirit came together for me. When I went from running like a four five to running a four two in six weeks by just working on certain mechanics of my body. When uh, I would get kicked out of meetings because I had, I had studied, I started studying the playbook a little bit more in the plays because. I got embarrassed in, in practice. I went the wrong way and my coach just went off on me. He's like, the fuck is wrong with you, PJ? He's just like, how are you going to run with the ones when you keep effing up? And I'm just like, oh. <laughs> Did you just say run with the ones? Oh. <laughs> right, and so that's when I went home and I studied. And so I studied so much when I came back. I started saying the plays out loud without recognizing that I was saying the plays out loud. And so I would get kicked out of meetings because I wasn't allowing other people to, uh, <laughs> to answer, you know, <laughs> answer the questions. And so n- now I have this, this mind part that I just figured out and this, um, th- this physical part, I'm figuring out my body. And so the two are merging and, and I already have this internal, internal motivation that, you know, just keep on going, right? You're right there. You're right there. Don't stop. Don't stop. You know, don't let your foot off the gas. It doesn't matter. Keep going. And so I buy into all of this. My third year, going into my third year, uh, <clears throat> we go into camp. Camp, I'm in tip-top shape. Oh, i also mention while I'm playing football, I decided – that I wanted to to go and stay at a monastery, or live at a monastery, because I wanted to reach an ultra level of discipline. While you were playing? While I was playing. <clears throat> oh wow! While nice. I was playing, so I decided to go and stay at a monastery. So I, I think only the longest I stayed there was about uh, five days. Okay. And but it shifted a lot of perspective for me, my mind and everything else. But my, my, my sole purpose for going there was to be able to zen out on everybody whenever I come back. So I'm, I'm in tip top shape coming back third year. I felt like I've done everything that I need to do. Um, when I go to camp, it's hot outside. I'm hydrated. When we take water breaks, I don't even take the water breaks. I'm just waiting. But let's go. I was in supreme shape. I had supreme confidence and I just knew that nothing was going to take me out of the zone. Mm. Uh, and I ended up getting injured. I ended up getting injured. We ran a play and I remember I broke and I tripped. And as I tripped, I went to go and place my hand on the ground to pop back up. And But I was running so fast that when I put my hand on the ground, I just tripped and I grinded out my shoulder and I tore my labrum Mm -hmm. and I blacked out. And when I woke up, I started trying to fight everyone. That's what I saw on film. And then I tried to go back in in the huddle (laughs) and I had this grimace on my, uh, this this Mm -hmm. grimace on my face. And my teammates were like, yo, what's, you all right? I was like, yeah, I'm good, man. Just run the plate, man. And then they they called the crowd and they called I don't know what's going on with my shoulder, man. Oh. Right, so uh, we come to find out. I tore my, I tore my labrum, and so I, I end up, I ended up not playing that year, and I decided to go and get surgery. Uh, and I set out. So my third year, I set out. So now the Ravens let me go. I, I do my rehabilitation in in Atlanta, Georgia, at, at Georgia Tech, because I wanted to go to a familiar place. 
you work so hard and now uh, the opportunity that you had is just diminished after you if you got after you got hurt so i uh, experiencing this self identity crisis like who am i you know am i worthy enough so i i sequestered myself i took a retreat and i, mm-hmm. I rented this apartment no bed no furniture just an air bed in my wow. two house. and i i just wanted to get back to you know um the basics what what got me there all right so i would go and work out at georgia tech uh i would go work out in the woods and 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 just just get back to that core prince wow and 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 when i returned so i never showed my face either when i went to baltimore it was just like a a a, a embarrassing and shameful thing and not enough i'm I'm underperforming Mm. so I, i never communicated with anyone and then I just show up out of the blue, like, hey, let's, let, let's get to it. I'm ready. You know, I'm healthy. I'm good to go. And the Raven said, well, we're going to go in a different direction. And she's like, well, what you mean? What, what, why? And, and what I did not understand was your level of responsibility. You know, in order to be a man, you have to be able to manage your responsibilities. And I had a difficult time managing my emotions. Uh, let alone managing any responsibilities. Uh, so I, I didn't know what was happening, what was going on, I had no emotional intelligence. I was always uh, on on edge. You know? And so um, they let me go and <clears throat> like, well, man, what's going on? And so um, I, got, I got another workout with the, with the Buffalo Bills. I didn't do so well. And then that was pretty much the end of my career. So from that point wow. on, I started working out religiously every single day, you know, like hope in hopes of someone calling. And I worked out 365 days. I kid you not. Uh, workouts, yoga, uh, um, swimming pool, like every day, Monday through Sunday. And I did it again every week. And I was waiting for someone to call. No one ever called. Mm-hmm. Since no one ever called, it just just left me in, 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 a, in a state of like, man, uh, like, Nope, nope, nobody wants me anymore, mm-hmm. right? And so, so the the self identity crisis, crisis, and then that transition, not uh, hoping that someone will call, no one called, and now I'm just stuck. And then I started to to question myself of like, what happened? Uh, it was their fault. It wasn't my fault. You know, I did everything right, but I didn't understand about communicating. Right. So I started putting the blame on everybody else. And then I started getting angry and that anger turned into a depression and uh, and it just down spiraled from there. And then it just put me in a space where I didn't like myself anymore. And I didn't want to spend any time with myself. And, and I was extremely lost. And luckily, I had been practicing meditation, you know, so that was the one thing I was able to fall back upon. Mm-hmm. And so I started practicing meditation. It was helping, but it, it 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 wasn't filling that void that I had fast enough. I'm super depressed, and I'm I'm trying to figure out what's my next move. Lose my job, the money that was coming in extremely fast every 17 weeks, uh, gone. No more influx of, of of money. You know, I got bills to pay. I have a lifestyle to up to to up. Oh man, upkeep. Right, so things just so many cascading, like down spiraling, just boom, boom, mm-hmm. boom, one thing after another. It was a domino effect, boom, 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 boom. Mm. And I'm young. I'm, I'm, I'm at this time I'm like 23, 24, 25. Wow. You know, and, and and things start happening, man. and there's no uh, uh, other business at the time that I could think of that could pay right. this amount of money, you know, within a small amount of time with right. the skill sets that I had. Right. Right. <laughs> so that's that's like a um. Uh, a physician, you know, <laughs> like studying all these years and then right. one surgery, and then it's just like you can never do surgery anymore. It's just like, whoa, 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 whoa what type of living? You know, like how do right. I transition? And how do I adapt? And so mm-hmm. for me, it was it was very difficult. So um, as I mentioned before, I didn't like myself, and even when I would practice my meditation, it was a struggle for me. So um, I decided to. I need to put it into all of this, this pain, this misery, and this embarrassment. And so um, I decided that I wanted to uh, commit, you know, um, suicide because I had this 
these these thoughts uh, um, of I'm not enough. You embarrass yourself. You embarrass your family, and and everybody is dis- is disappointing in you. You're disappointing yourself. So I would just lock myself up in my room, and at that time I I just bought um I just bought a gun, and I was just like, man, I don't. I don't want to do this anymore. I don't. I don't want to be here anymore. I don't want to live anymore. And for me, it was just the thought of I don't want to see myself. Like I covered up my mirror with sticky notes, with the sticky pads, and I just covered up the mirror just so I could just see my eyes. But that was it. I just didn't want to see me. Like I, I was so disgusted with myself. Mm -hmm. Uh, And. From that point on, um, it was a, it was a, a a day. So I put together this three day three day demise, where first day I was going to practice uh, with with pulling the trigger, and the second day I was going to do the same thing. And I, you know, I was practicing on myself. Uh, and I said, third day I'm just going to load uh, the weapon and and you know end this and. Uh, on the third day, for whatever reason, I, I called seven people. And in the first six people that I called, my mother, one of my professors from college, I called Haloti, you know, mm-hmm. and I called a couple other people, but I never expressed to them what I was going through, the first six people. And I remember speaking to Haloti, and I'm like, what up, Haloti? You know, he's like, what's up, Pete? You know, he got this the real soft, sweet voice. And he's <laughs> like, what's up, Pete? He's like, He's like, oh man, man, I miss you, bro. Like, I hope you're doing well. It's just like, yeah, man, I'm doing good. And that was wow. the first time that I felt excitement. Mm. Being able to talk to my, my brother. And then he he had to cut it short. He's like, I, I, I gotta go to practice, man. I, you know, I'll talk to you later. And I just remember like my that excitement that I had, it just yeah. disappeared very quickly. Mm. And so from that point on, I was just like, I you know. I think I'm 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 ready to go ahead and and, and commit this. Mm-hmm. I ended up calling the the seventh individual, and that seventh individual was the the guru at the monastery that I would, had been uh, visiting uh, while I was in the league league. And I remember calling, and I just said to myself, you know what? I'm just going to share what I'm going through, right? Because I wasn't sharing what I was going through with, with the first six people that I called. And so I just said, I'm just going to lay it out there. He's a guru. Uh, hopefully he can do something with his guru powers, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, I was looking for a miracle. And mm-hmm. he didn't give me a miracle, but he gave me a disruption in my thought patterns and my thought process, and which I see as a miracle. I told them what I was going, what was going on. I lost my job. I lost my, I lost my, my, you know, my career. I'm losing my money. I lost my my relationship. I'm doing this and I'm, and I'm, I'm going to kill myself. And it was silence for about 10 seconds. And I'm waiting for him to, to, to speak like any, any average person or any human being would just say, Oh no! Don't do that! Don't do right. They talk you out. <laughs> talk you out of it, right? And there, there was just solemn silence. And the first thing he said was, "Are you done?" And I remember that was the first exhale and sigh, like, "Huh?" And he said. Meditate <laughs> and hung up the phone. <laughs> I was like, oh, I'm about to off myself. All yeah, right, right. So I'm angry. I'm angry at him. I'm angry at God. I'm angry at I'm just angry at myself. I don't even know who to be angry at. <laughs> right. And so as I as I get up from the kitchen table and I walk back to my room, to my right is where I set up my my weapon and my area where I was going to commit my 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 act and to my left was my meditation pillow and for whatever reason it seemed like it was a ray of sunshine beaming on my meditation pillow and I'm looking and I see it and I'm like 
what's going on with my mind? Like, I lost my mind. I started wow. crazy. Like, God, what are you doing? Like, you like, no, I don't need this. Like, you didn't let me have my career. And now you tell me I need to meditate. Like, F you, God, you know, just all types of stuff because I'm just angry. Mm. And I remember saying to myself, I'm going to, okay, I'll make a promise to myself. I'll meditate for one hour. And th- during this meditation, uh, if something comes out of it, then cool. Uh, if nothing comes out of it, then let's go through with this plan. I decided to sit down. And during that, that one hour, I learned so much about myself, about how I struggled to sit with my disappointments, my embarrassments, and uh, being very shameful, uh, how I wasn't able to support myself at the time because in my, in my posture, in my meditation, I was leaning to the side, slouching. I was at, I was going through so much pain at the time because uh, my hips they were they were bothering me from sitting in in the cross leg position, and so I'm just moving around. I start to sweat like mm-hmm. I'm sweating profusely. I got sweat dripping down my face, dripping into my eyes, and <laughs> and so uh, it was like the last few minutes of my meditation, the last three minutes. And I remember opening my eyes and, and looking at the clock and I said, all right, I got three more minutes. I said, man, I said, why did I want to do this one hour meditation? I said, I need to get up because I'm just in a lot of pain. And that, that's what I was going through. I was going through pain, suffering, you know, not being able to support myself and believe in myself and, and uh, sit with myself. And those last three minutes, something happened. And in and, and, and that happening, uh, uh, the pain went away. The outside of my knees hit the floor. And wow. I remember my energy from the lower part of my body just went straight into my heart and into my head. Wow. And it was, it was a moment of silence. A moment of clarity. Mm. There was a, a a voice, and the voice said to me, "What are you doing?" <laughs> and I said, "I'm about to kill myself." And the voice asked me that same question two more times. And the third time, instead of me saying, "I'm about to kill myself," well, I, I said it again. Because I kept answering with the same, uh, with, with the same answer, and the, the last time I said it, I said it in such a way where it was extremely conscious, and I said, "I'm about to kill myself," and the timer went off. And it was like, "Ding!" Wow. Ding. And I still have the timer right here. This is the timer. Uh, wow. <laughs> I still have the timer right here, and it went off. And when it went off, it was like I was vacuumed out of that space and tears just started streaming down my face. Wow. And I was like, ooh, 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 what was that? What was that? What was that? And so from that wow. point on, I got up and I put my weapon away and I said, okay, there's something more to this. And whatever that was that I just got a taste of, I want that for the rest of wow. my life. Wow. And that's how I became a devout like meditator monk uh and wanted to like go completely in that direction because i felt fulfilled with just within those that small moment and i've had many moments after that but that's when i discovered that there's something deeper within every single human being in this world and so my purpose and my job is to make sure that everyone connects with their energy their i-n-n-e-r capital g (laughs) Their inner good, their inner greatness, their inner gratitude, their inner inner goddess, their inner God, all of the above. I wanted to make sure that I follow that purpose and I make that purpose popular and share mm. it with the world. Mm. Thank you for sharing that with us. And I, I, it's what's making it come to my mind is um, I've had a lot of conscious experiences, you know, that that doesn't surprise me much, you know, even though it's powerful and beautiful, it's like, yeah, 
because we know that you have a purpose and we know you've got those beautiful little girls and there's a lot of goodness still for you to bring. And so it does not surprise me at all, but it's just like, no, no, no. What are you doing? <laughs> I love that. I feel, I feel like my guides or my higher self or whoever it is I'm talking to, they like communicate with me in a way that like fits me. Here's her like, what are you doing? <laughs> Yeah, I love I, it, but, I, but yeah. Wow. And that, um, it's really beautiful. I know like when we met, we were, you were really big on meditation and I'm big on meditation and it is life changing. And it, it's to me, it's like whatever way you see consciousness for some people in their religion, that's prayer. That's what I used to do was just, you know, pray. And that was my way. And then now it's a little bit different. It's like sort of prayer plus meditation plus silence and nature is another way for me, you know, clearing my mind and being in full presence or plant medicines for people or whatever way that it is. Like to me, what I hear is like in that moment, these troubles that you had, in this life of like not being able to play football and not having money seemed very small compared to the consciousness that you experienced in that moment that was able to help you get past that bridge, you know? So I can see why you're passionate about helping people see that because we do get so caught up in our minutia bullshit, you know, like really, truly like money is minutia bullshit when it comes to, and it doesn't feel like it sometimes, it really doesn't feel like it feels like big. It feels terrifying. Like we have all been through money scare moments and it's scary and I'm not undermining that, but like when you get to a place where you're able to tap in, like you're talking about is like, you can, you can hold yourself easier through those ultimate lows, you know? So thank you for speaking up on it and for sharing and just for just the incredible human being that you are well, human being, you know, in this Prince Daniels <laughs> junior form that you come in, in this life. <laughs> so thank you. And I just want to ask you to, uh, is this behind you? This is your book mindfulness for the yes. ultimate athlete. Yeah. Mindfulness for the ultimate athlete mastering the balance between power and peace. Mm. Yes. That's a, uh, a book that I, I, I've written um, to help athletes reach their ultimate uh, athletic part of themselves, reach that spiritual side of themselves. I talk about meditation and talking about um, how I took my speed from a 4.5 to a 4.2 by just working on my hips and my mechanics and uh, just also just becoming a student of the game, the student of life. Yeah understanding the principles of life once you understand those principles then you can build from that point on and uh, just encourage all athletes to read it because uh doing things the traditional way doesn't work as well uh in this new day and age and so we have to learn how to adapt to the change to the transition whether you are playing on the field just got uh, drafted or you're transitioning off the field or or whatever sport that you're playing. And the the most important thing that you take away from the book is just how to be in tune with whom you are and tap into your 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 greatness, your inner yeah. I love to say. So. Yeah, I hear lace throughout your story is kind of like at what I this is just my reflection, but I found it really interesting that like when even at a young age, when you had a goal, when you had a vision, when you had a dream, like you would never, you would not abandon yourself, no matter how nasty people could get in your face and tell you you're a piece of shit and you suck. Like that is like the most painful thing ever to hear. You know, you suck, man. Like we don't even want you. Just get out of here, you piece of crap. Nobody likes you. Like you're 18 years old, but you didn't abandon yourself ever because you had like a vision, you had a goal, you had, you know, and that is really cool for athletes to make sure that they're clear. And I feel like what happened when you got to your ultimate low was like, there was no goal. There was no vision. There was like nowhere to go. It was just this hopeless, pointless, probably feeling, you know, and now it's cool. Cause I know that you're, you know, you've turned a lot of that into sharing your message or to your daughters, you know, and like your family and like that, you know? So I think that there's also for me laced throughout your um, story is like the importance of knowing where, where, what you want, where you're going, you know, because once you have that, it's easier to support yourself, really? you know, once that's clear. Yeah. You yeah. know, I, I don't want to be too incredulous, but I want to give 
some props to my my, my family <laughs> because they, they were they were the people that supported me and it it taught me how to love myself no matter what yeah, yeah. and so when somebody else says something to you it doesn't matter what their opinion means like just keep moving forward because yeah. They are saying something that they're not capable of doing or that they have not done or accomplished in their life. And so just stay focused on that goal, focus, 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 and 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 everything will work itself out. And so that's that that's where that comes from. Just I I, I love me so much. And not in yeah. a in a in a, um, a vain way, but right. love me. I, I love what God created. Mm. And I, I initially, when I, I I did that when I was younger, I mean that that happened naturally when I was younger, and then as I started, you know, uh, maturing and going through this world, that a lot of doubt came into my life, mm. and meditation was the tool that allowed for that doubt to dissipate, right? And yep. and because. If you're in a relationship and you spend time with someone, you 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 start to become more conscious of why you love that person or why you dislike that person, right? And so, uh, when you practice meditation, you're spending time with who? Right. You. So right. you 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 become conscious of why you like yourself and why you dislike yourself. Yeah. And so, if you can find more ways of why you like yourself and dislike yourself, yeah. then you will fall in love with yourself, and then you'll start to fall in love with with, with what God created. Mm, and I love that. I, I hear the saying all the time that you know we're not we're not perfect, but that is not true. Like <laughs> <laughs> a creator, a create creator does not create imperfection. They they when they create they they do it with their whole heart and mind, mm -hmm. and they don't turn turn it in and say, uh, you know it's not perfect, but here you go. <laughs> <laughs> they don't do that, and we are all perfect in our own way. I'm, 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 I guarantee you that if if God is love, then He would not like short. Sure, himself <laughs> on creating, you know, who yeah. you are. And so that's what I want people to re remind themselves of. Don't say that you're not perfect. Find where where your perfection lies and, and mm -hmm. live to that. Mm -hmm. But we are all perfect. We are all God's children. We are all perfect. Mm -hmm. So allow for that perfection to, to shine bright, just like how the sun shines every single day. Mm, thank you so much, Prince. You're so um, where, where else? Do you have social media? Yeah, I do. I'm on social media. I'm at Prince A D J R. Okay. Uh, yeah, you can find me on Instagram. Reach out to me. DM me. Uh, let me know that you heard my story. You can talk. Um, but um, lately, I've been having my head down and working. I've been, I've been uh, uh, homeschooling. I've been in real estate. I've been in, in working in finances and and my macro and microeconomics. Just I, I right now I'm looking to be extremely expansive and and also put on events for for um, athletes and everybody in the world and individuals in this world and so looking to collaborate with people like yourself T and and other athletes as well to um, just continue to um, push this narrative and just to remind people that uh, let go of all the frivolous things the the the, the low level thoughts and rise into your higher consciousness, um, um, connect with higher vibrations, like create the vibration within you so you can hum and, and, and raise your level of frequency. And so you connect with, with, with like-minded individuals, like soul individuals, like it starts with you. We are, you know, if you, we study atoms, but you have to remember that we are made up of atoms and you can be a positive atom, or positive, like a, a proton or an electron, you can choose to be positive or negative. So every day, just remember that, like mm -hmm. you're you're constantly buzzing even when you're asleep. You're constantly uh, vibrating at a higher frequency even when you're awake and asleep. Mm -hmm. So 
when you wake up, you have a choice to be positive. So choose that positivity, live into it, what you know, create a positive armor about yourself. I have I have one of my 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 uh limited edition shirts that I haven't put out just yet, but it's all positive aphorisms, positivity, oh, I love it. you know, caress, miracles, affection, own. Like all the words that elicits a, a, a vibration that makes you feel good about yourself. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I call it the healing shirt uh, um, because um, that's what the, these words are doing. My slogan mm-hmm. is words are powerful, but the right words are impactful. Mm-hmm. Wear them. Wear them? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Well, let me know when those are available because I want to get some for some dudes. That's, that shirt is super cool. I've been admiring it the whole time. I'm like, what does it say on there? Cool. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll watch for that and I'll we'll link up your book and social on in the show notes. And yeah, I just can't tell you again. Thank you enough. Please tell your daughters. I said, thank you for sparing their dad and their homeschool teacher. <laughs> and we'll go ahead and close it up. Thank you, Prince. Uh, thank you so much, T. And if you need me for anything, I promise you I'll be there to drop up done. Thank you. You got my word. You got my promise. <laughs> and when I make thank a promise, you. just know that I always keep <laughs> I believe you. <laughs>